If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. Your body's going to respond to stress is screaming at you and making you do crazy stuff. Observing the signs. You think somebody could have killed her? I hope not. Detecting changing stories. If you go ahead and take a polygraph test and you don't do well, well, now we're really going to be all over you. Spotting when to hold back. He's starting to feel like, I've got this. He believes me. And when to close in. I started informing him of what other detectives were doing. The suspect is on his knees in figurative terms. And then you just start hitting them with hammers. Bam, bam, bam. I'm Vivica A. Fox. As an award-winning actress, I know how to play a part and convince audiences I'm someone else. I can spot the signs when someone is playing a role and not being honest. We'll expose the lies and uncover the shocking truth on our journey to uncover the secrets of the interrogation room. Springfield, Missouri. All right, Jay, again, I appreciate you coming in and, and talking with me, especially since I hadn't even talked to you on the phone. At police headquarters, 65-year-old retiree Jay Roth has asked to see Detective Neil McCamus. What do you know so far about what's going on? I saw her last night at about uh, 3 10, I left. Roth is worried about his friend, 53-year-old Linda Riley. He just learned that she's been reported missing. The previous day, a neighbor became worried when she could hear Linda's phone repeatedly ringing. Upon entering the unlocked property, there was no sign of Linda. She called the police, who were concerned upon arrival because of what they found. Her purse is here, her phone's here. It looks like there's been a struggle of some sort, and they agreed with her, right? I mean, what woman leaves the house without a phone anymore, or without her purse, or without both? Somebody who's pretty endangered is most policemen's guess. Linda Riley is described by her family as a kind, fun-loving person who loved animals and was devoted to her dogs. As someone always determined to see the good in people, it meant that she could also be very trusting of strangers. This further alarms the Springfield Police Department, and they issue a missing endangered person alert and begin an investigation into her disappearance. The response by the police being um, happening so quickly was simply because of the evidence at the crime scene. Nobody can get a hold of her, speak with her. It was, it was apparent that uh, we needed to move as quickly as we could with the investigation. She'd left her dogs, and everybody who knew her, her neighbor who actually reported her, said she would never leave the dogs behind. Was she taken by force? Who took her? Who saw her? So straight away, those questions are going to be paramount in the detectives' heads. It's, it's obviously very stressful, um, especially in a disappearance case like this, where essentially your victim is just gone. There's multiple aspects with it. Of course, you have the family that wants answers, but also you have the public concern, too, of. Who did this? What happened? Do we need to be in fear? You know, it's, it's very difficult. Jay Roth was with Linda Riley two nights ago. Since then, he's been out of town fishing. Given their close friendship and recent contact, could Jay be the key to helping detectives in their attempt to locate her? I saw her. Last night at about uh, 3 10, I left. Uh, she said maybe she's going to get some cigarettes, but she's tired and went to bed. The fact that Roth was the last person to have been with Linda before she went missing definitely makes him a person of interest in this investigation. I don't know if I would label him a suspect, but he will be a person of interest. I asked me if I take the garbage on. I threw that one. In the van and took that and dumped it. And then when I got uh, back to the house, I texted her. They got home okay. Because other said she's worried about me. So. He deeply cared for Linda, and it, it really seemed like he was there doing everything he could to try to help locate Linda and to try to, you know, 
help police the, in the investigation and in, in trying to figure out what had gone on. He's doing a voluntary interview, so he's not under arrest. You know, he doesn't have to be there. He's free to leave at any time. Um, so that's the first thing that struck me, that, you know, he seems this really affable guy who's just there to help. Nice and easy going, you know, breathing rate normal, no signs of any anxiety. So just a, just a guy that just wants to help. Jay Roth's attendance at the, the police station as a volunteer is commendable. At the end of the day, he is trying to find out where his partner, girlfriend, where she's gone. He's seen as being the good Samaritan in this piece. I called this morning, she didn't answer. She does that all the time, though, you know, not answer. So, but I don't know. Yeah. So I'm worried about her, but what else? As a close friend of Linda's, Jay's knowledge of her life, habits, friends, and acquaintances could give the police the lead they desperately need. You know, did he see anybody hanging about? Was there anything untoward? Was Linda worried about anything? She was stressed out a little bit about these guys that had been coming over this, that one guy in particular. Who, who was that that she was stressed about? I think it was the Floyd guy that come in the house the other night, drunk. So you just know him as, he's a black male I, named Floyd? I saw him one time, but I don't know him, you know. He came in the house and... You don't know Floyd's last name? No, not at all. So what did she say about that, that she was stressed out about? Oh, man, the guy come in the house and he, and he was halfway in the living room, she said. And she kind of pushed him out the door and something went out. And then night before last, he'd come back over and he was drunk is, is what they said. I don't know if he was or not. The neighbor saw him. So that you're come saying over. Saturday night? You said the night before last? I just wondered. Yeah, but it was Saturday night. Yeah. Saturday night. Mm -hmm. well, okay. So what do you think? What What do you think happened? I don't know. Anything could happen with that neighborhood there and stuff. It's a bad neighborhood. That's where that kid got shot across the street from. Right. right. There's all kinds of going on over there. Okay. Roth's demeanor led me to believe that he was being open and honest with the detectives and truly trying to help them in trying to find Linda. You have to listen to him because he may actually be that helpful person who's really concerned about Linda, who wants to help and wants her found quickly. And missing people, if they're found quickly within the first 24 hours or so, they're more likely to be found alive. The longer it takes to find that person, the more chances are that that person is going to be unwell or dead. The police are all but certain 53-year-old Linda Riley was met with foul play. However, she's only been missing for a little over 24 hours. There is still a chance Linda can be found alive. The initial hope is, is that she just got into it with somebody, maybe she's at somebody's home. They need a lead in order to progress this case, and it could be information provided by friend Jay Roth will show them the way forward. So you just know him as Floyd? I saw him one time, but I don't know. Will the 65-year-old retiree's information be enough to save Linda? Coming up, Detective McCamus narrows his focus. Your super secret police antenna should shoot right up when you hear that statement. Do you have anything to do with her being missing right now? No. Roth is put to the ultimate test. Man said that you were interested in taking a polygraph exam. So he has to take the gamble. 53-year-old divorcee Linda Riley has been reported missing. She hasn't been seen in a little over 24 hours. The Springfield police are convinced someone is responsible for her disappearance. You think maybe she's been harmed? I don't know, but the dad's coming in the house like it. Anything could happen. Her friend Roth has asked to see detectives to assist with search efforts. He is concerned about some of the company Linda has been keeping. Detective McCamus wants to know more. Who would want her dead? I don't, I don't know. I don't know who would want her dead. But I don't know some of these weird guys, like I said, she has come over and gives her number and stuff. You know? A lot of that crap going on lately. Initially, the detective needs to focus on the individuals that he has in front of him. And if the investigation progresses, he can start looking at those and widening the search. But initially, he does need to look at what's right under his nose. At this point, 
Detective McCamus surprises Roth by suggesting any concern around Linda's disappearance could be an overreaction. Do you think that she maybe just left? This leads Roth into arguing the case and offering additional reasons to be concerned about Linda. What he says is compelling, but he inadvertently alerts Detective McCamus' suspicions. Just, I mean, no, she wouldn't leave without her dog. She was like, no. You mean, because like, she said she wanted to get out of town, but she wouldn't leave with her dog. You know, like that. When he made the statement, you know, she would not leave her dogs, that definitely stood out to me. Okay. You know, Are her dogs still there? As far as I know, they were when I left. How would he know that the dogs are, are were still there? There was no way for him to have that information at that point. Could they still be there, you think? Oh, I can imagine so. Okay. I don't know. Now, that could be a problem for him because how does he know the dogs were left? How does he know she didn't ask a neighbor to watch the dogs? She didn't drop the dogs off at a friend's house, whatever, right? But he immediately said, oh, no, she, she wouldn't leave the dogs there, which, you know, your super secret police antenna should shoot right up when you hear that statement. For Detective McCamus, Jay Roth has just changed from a concerned friend to a person of interest. And the interview is now an interrogation. What would you consider your guys' relationship? Okay. Pretty good friends. Good friends? Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, I helped her more than anybody else. Yeah. So nobody else would even help me because they were sure. afraid, of, afraid of him. Sure. So you guys are good friends. Has she ever wanted an intimate relationship with you? Oh, yeah. You had a little bit of an intimate relationship? Maybe having sex on occasion, is that what you're talking yes. about? Okay. Okay. When was the last time you guys had sex? Oh, probably a couple months ago. A couple months ago. Have you guys ever had any physical um, violence? No hitting, pushing, shoving, no. nothing at all like that? No. So just some verbal arguments is yeah. all? Yeah, yeah. Did you have anything to do with her being gone? With her, with her being missing right now? No. I wouldn't. No. I'm worried about it, like I said. All right, Jay, if I can have you hang tight for me for just a second. Sure. You step out and I'll be right back, okay? Mm -hmm. right, thank you, sir. When detectives ask direct questions to people, do you think she's dead? Do you know what happened to her? They're also wanting to see the response, the nonverbal cues or the verbal cues that a suspect or person of interest gives back to them. And very often a suspect will evade discussing that because they don't want to talk about it, especially if they're involved. So that, oh, I don't know. There'll be a, more of a vague answer to the question. These are things that are very important to a detective when questioning somebody. Having spent nearly two hours helping cops with their investigation, Jay Roth returns home. 24 hours later, there is still no trace of Linda Riley. Hopes that she will be found alive are fading fast. There is that hope that, that she is alive, but obviously the longer time goes on and nobody hears from her, there's no, you know, there's no financial transactions being made from her account, then obviously as time goes on, it, it becomes more evident that, that we're gonna be dealing with a homicide situation. Then, at police headquarters, Jay Roth reappears without warning. He has new information to offer. It almost comes across as he's gone home, thought about the answers that he's given the day before, and decided to elaborate on some of them. There are uh, a couple, three things, actually. Her ex, uh, Charles Wilhite, mm -hmm. he beat her, pulled her hair. She come down to the house one, one morning after he'd sit on her and tried to shoot her up and missed and threw her in the spot. It was all, and he, she always had bruises on her arms where he grabbed her and stuff. He starts mentioning her ex-husband. He starts mentioning people that she's hanging around with. It's almost like he's volunteering suspects to Detective Amos. And as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking, well, you, are you trying to detract from yourself being a suspect 
or are you actually being helpful? It was a scattergun approach. He was trying his hardest to drag other people into the investigation. So one time, she had this guy named Roger was there, and he stayed about a week or so. But uh, the police came to the door, and he was hitting the bathroom because he was wanted, is what they said. And I don't know his last name or anything else. It's almost like he's got an agenda. He's going to tell the detective what he wants him to hear. And he's going through this list almost manically. It's trying to give a lot of information in a very short period of time. He seems quite agitated and quite excitable about it all. I told her, you got too many weirdos coming over and stuff like that. So I'm just putting things out there as possibilities I was thinking about. Roth also wants to make an adjustment to something he said yesterday. You ask if I've ever hit her or she hit me? I haven't. But there was one occasion when I was, uh, take, I took her over to see this guy she wanted to see, and we could drop her off, but he wasn't home. I started telling what are you doing? I said, I'm gonna take you home. I don't wanna go home. I said, well, I'm not gonna let you out here. I want out. I said, like, I said, don't, don't jump out of here. Let me take you home. And she reached over, grabbed the horn, and my hand, I went up like this, and it went in her mouth. She thought I got her pregnant. It was an accident completely. She had filed a complaint, but he had forgotten that and went, oh, uh-oh, I better go try and explain that one away. So once again, down at the police station with diarrhea to the mouth, not helping his cause at all. Linda reported Roth um, for assaulting her because she wouldn't have sex with him. And she said that he had punched her in her face and her, his fist was in her mouth. At the point of her refusing, he takes his fist and he tries to forcibly ram it into her mouth. I mean, that's a, an extremely violent act. Unfortunately, domestic violence does escalate and it can, and quite often it does result in a death because that violence will become worse and worse over time. So the fact that there was this report would have been quite worrying. If Roth thinks he can paper over his past violence toward Linda, he is wrong. The cops have been investigating and alarm bells are ringing. You know, we've talked to a ton of people today and, uh, there's been a few people that have mentioned she was afraid of you. Do you know why they would tell us that? Because of that action, she thought I was doing something, but I wasn't. But then we talked after her and it was okay. But she wasn't afraid of me for that. Okay. You know. Because they talked about some other assaults. What do you say to some of these people that kind of had have said that she's scared of you, that you'd been violent with her? I haven't been violent with her, and I don't know where that comes from. Really. You don't know why those people would say that? Because uh, the biggest hang-up today, because we've talked to so many people, mm -hmm. and nobody, there's no side, no trace of her or anything after you leave the house, mm -hmm. a little after three. How do, how do we, I mean, where do we go from there? In, in my second interview with Jay, he still was very helpful, very cooperative. So at that point, I just was trying to keep him on board to try to keep him talking, try to maintain that, that, that good relationship with him that we had so that it would help me if, if I did need to speak with him on a, on a future occasion, which of course happened. Hang on one second, we'll be right back and we'll, we'll get you out of here in just a minute, okay? okay. okay. Jay has now had two interviews with Detective McCamus. They've both been friendly, they've been cordial. Detective McCamus has a really nice disposition. He has a really great way of connecting with people. He develops great rapport with those people he interviews. And Jay's feeling more confident. He's now walked out of an interview room with Detective McCamus twice. He's starting to feel like, I've got this, I'm, I'm okay, like he believes me. This is exactly what McCamus wants Jay Roth to feel. In reality, he's become more certain that Roth is responsible for Linda's disappearance. I think there was a point he, almost, he felt like he could trust me, uh, as odd as that may sound, and therefore it was just able to you know, chip away at him just a little bit at a time, uh, from one interview to the next, from one day to the next. But with Linda still missing, McCamus needs to speed things up and find a way through Jay's helpful facade. During my interviews with Jay, it just there were so many stumbling blocks that, that just kept coming up and it was hard to get him to 
go further down uh, the path of questioning that I was taking him. So I tried to uh, come up with a new tactic and that was uh, the polygraph. Polygraph's an investigative tool and there will be people that will tell you a polygraph is worthless, it's no good science-wise, uh, no court allows its admission in cases. Uh, but I'll tell you, the CIA and FBI will fire you if you fail a polygraph, if you're a 20-year employee even, right? You're gone. A suspect cannot be forced to take a polygraph test, but it's the fact they have a choice that makes them so useful to an investigation. If a polygraph is suggested to an individual who's trying to be helpful, trying to be friendly, and trying to locate their friend who is missing and they're really concerned about him, that person is likely to say, yes, I'll do it. If you refuse to take the polygraph test, it definitely sends off alarm bells in a detective's mind. Why would you not want to take a test? I think it's fair to say that Roth is a simple soul. He wouldn't know the intricacies of the law. He wouldn't understand the balances placed in undertaking a polygraph test or not. But he would be thinking, if I don't assist the authorities, they're going to start to draw inference on my lack of support. Three days later, Roth agrees to take the polygraph test. But after arriving at police headquarters, he's deflated and withdrawn. Even this could be a useful clue. Throughout the first two interviews, Roth does come across as being quite relaxed. He sits back in his chair. He's quite an animated. He's quite friendly. And he's got a lot of information that he wants to share. He's been helpful. He's been helping police with their inquiries. Now it's he's being investigated. He's being looked at as a suspect. And I think that probably has dawned on him by now. Jay, I'm the polygraph examiner here with the police department. They called me and said that you were interested in taking a polygraph exam in reference to the, their investigation with Linda. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. OK, I'll walk you out. Hold on. Jay is now feeling the heat. He's starting to figure out I'm the number one suspect with a bullet, and I got a problem. So your body's going to respond to this stuff. Stress, right? Stress is the, the great internal thing that's just screaming at you and making you do crazy stuff. If you look straight ahead for me, Jay, I'll get you dialed back in, and we'll begin. Are you physically responsible for Linda Riley's disappearance from her residence on February 27th, 2012? No. Did you physically remove Linda Raleigh from her residence on February 27th, 2012? No. So the fact that you're willing to take a polygraph test is usually a you know, plus in your column. But if you go ahead and take it and you don't do well, well, now we're really going to be all over you. It's, it's almost over with at that point for you. Did you physically cause the death of Linda Raleigh on February 27th, 2012? No. Jay Roth claims he is just trying to help, and his willingness to go through with a polygraph test proves it. But it's the results that count. Either they'll clear his name, or they'll put him firmly in the frame, not only for Linda Riley's disappearance, but also her probable murder. Coming up, the results are in. That's kind of what we both knew. And Detective McCamus turns up the heat. There's some more stuff that's been located at your house. Again, it's not looking good for you. You just start hitting them with hammers. Bam, bam, bam. At police headquarters in Springfield, Missouri, it's a pivotal moment for the investigation into missing 53-year-old Linda Riley. I tried to come up with a new tactic, and that was uh, the polygraph. I felt like that was an angle that I could really go down to try to pursue with him. Will a lie detector test confirm Detective McCamus' suspicions, or will it blow the case wide open? While the polygraph examiner prepares his results, Roth waits nervously in the interrogation room. Now, someone's response to being told they failed a polygraph will be linked to their um, belief in how sort of valid it is. Well, we got the results back, Jay, and it's kind of what we both knew. He failed it pretty bad. So, oh, yeah, so let's just, let's just cut to the chase. He tells Roth he's failed it and that they both expected him to fail it. And it's almost, you could see the visible change in Roth 
because he, he does become dejected. It's like almost like the the life has come out of his body. Okay. Tell us tell us what happened. Let's get this over with. It's been a long day for us all. You know, you see him sag in that interview room and it's almost like, well, that's it. I'm at the end of it. What do I do now? He knows. And it's, it is that realisation. Detective McCamus knows I lied. So clearly Roth believed that the polygraph was basically, you know, undeniably yes or no. So that went some way um, in that being the catalyst really for him beginning to unravel. I didn't hurt her, I didn't take her. Everything was fine when I left. I decided that it was kind of gonna be a turning point of, of my interview with Jay where I was gonna kind of turn up the tension a little bit more with him. Well, Jay, what you're not aware of um, right now is our uh, crime scene technicians, they're out at your house. They've been serving a search warrant at your house pretty much all day, okay? okay? And there's some more stuff that's been located at your house that's, again, it's not looking good for you. Another big chip off of Jay was when I started informing him of what other detectives were doing, that search warrants were being conducted on his van and at his residence. And you could just see the look on, on his face. It was, it was noticeable in terms of uh, it went from nervous to straight being scared. Obviously, there's going to be some explaining to do. Okay. And I'm just, I'm going to be curious about what, what kind of deal you're going to come up with now. So Jay gets it with the first thing, hey, you failed the polygraph. I know you did this. And oh, by the way, Jay, we're tearing that little trailer of yours, that double wide, we're tearing it apart piece by piece, and we're going to find the evidence. And this is overwhelming. They do this on purpose, right? They hit them with all the bad news at once. It was really a competent move by the detective. You know, you build up, build up, build up, and then you just start hitting them with hammers. Bam, bam, bam. McCamus slams on more pressure by letting Roth know his adult son, Jason, is now aware of the case against him. He came home today to discover the search warrant, and uh, yeah. he's really upset about the situation because he realizes what's going on, and he knows, he knows what you did. You don't need to be putting this kind of kind of grief on him as well. And he seems like he's a pretty good kid. This for me was Jay's breaking point. And Detective McCamus knew this. I could see that Detective McCamus picked up on this because he did not let her go. He kept on, he kept on pushing. Your son knows, Jay, do this for your son. Your son's a good boy. He knows you're not a bad person. You know, Jason's upset, he got, he got emotional. Um, he wants you to get this over with, mm -hmm. okay? He wants this ended because he doesn't need this. Jay was just nodding his head and agreeing and you could see that Detective McCamus knew that he now had his end. He was almost there. We need to get this over with, quit these games. We know something happened. How it happened, I don't know. And that's what I'd like is, is your reason. Did she come after you? Did, uh, you know, maybe something happened that wasn't good. Whatever it is, is we need to know, Jay. You need to tell us. You will always see a detective use the strategy of trying to minimize a suspect's culpability in a homicide. It's much harder for somebody to admit killing somebody in cold blood than it is to blame the victim as well. Oh, well, the victim had something to do with it. So he starts hitting with, you know, I know you're a nice guy. Things got out of hand. These things happen. And a mistake occurred. We all make them. Yeah. Okay. And that's all that it was, Jay. That's all that it was. It was a simple mistake. One that, you know, let, let's just deal with. Okay. What's the goal? Get an admission. We don't care how we get the admission, but get some sort of admission. We'll build on a little admission into the big admission. I know you did not go over there with the intent. And I think Jason knows it as well, just from what he said, okay? It was a, it was a mistake, it was a freak occurrence, okay? Once Detective McCamus has picked up on his in now and that he's almost at the confession, he like moves his body in, like he actually uses his rolling chair and puts himself right into Jay's space. 
Look at me, I'm right up in your face. I don't believe you're a bad person. That's what it was, it's just a free occurrence. I know that's what it was. What the detective does do is, at this point, he starts having a lot longer silences, and those silences are worth a huge amount in any inv investigation, because it's inviting him to fill that silence with the story, with an account of what happened. And it goes back again to this cognitive overload. That was the point in his unconscious that he just, he just couldn't carry on with it anymore. The pressure was just too much. The suspect is on his knees in figurative terms. It just was a free thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And Jay breaks down and at that point admits to it being a freak accident. Well, well, well tell me, tell me about it. I, I know it just, I, I know that's not, not you. So tell me, tell me, tell me how it all went down. Jay is now drowning and we have this detective who's like offering his hand. Jay, come on, you and I will get through this together. It's not as bad as it seems. In fact, it's horrible. We were talking on the couch and so did. Get along just fine and all. And we are talking about her getting out of there, like I said. And I don't know, just, just things happen. I don't know. Doesn't mean to do anything. The empathetic way that the officer deals with the suspect is really good. He's giving the suspect the opportunity to unload on him and share his burden. Roth hasn't got anybody to confide in. I don't think he's got any real friends. The officer is probably the closest relationship that he's had in talking to somebody for some considerable time. Why are you having people stay over? To are hurting you and like that, or she got mad, you know, like I said, she doesn't talk. I guess scuffled a little bit and stuff. Banged her head. So I took, took it over to the house. Uh, so I guess she was mad at what I thought of her. And she went and just smacked me. I said, you don't need to be doing mad stuff like that. She thought I'd holler at me. And I smacked her and she fell and hit her head. My goodness, she didn't, she didn't come around. It hurts me so much, man. No, it does. No, it does. Because we're really true to care of you and do whatever. But I know. We do have a pretty good relationship. When Jay finally confessed, it, it really is its difficult to describe the uh, array of emotions that take place. This, My interviews with him lasted several days over just numerous, numerous hours. But when the confession happens, you go from being mentally and physically just drained beyond imagined to you get this adrenaline rush that is hard to describe. Jay Roth has confessed to killing Linda Riley in his trailer home after a heated argument. But for Detective McCamus, the investigation has only just begun. You got a statement, you got a confession, great. Now we need something to really lock this thing down. And this is important because you don't want in four, five, six, seven years, appellate court going, uh, this guy's claiming it was a false confession made under duress. So you want to get some physical evidence that he leads you to that's gonna lock this thing down. In order to get a conviction, the police must first show that a murder has in fact taken place. The best way to prove it is to find the victim's body. Where's Linda? Linda still has to be found. So he has to carry on with that rapport. It's not over just because Roth has said I killed her. Coming up. Detective Neil McCamus starts to piece together what really happened to Linda Riley. I was not expecting anything like that, and so it was shocking to me at that point. I heard mom was still out there. I don't know if this is anything that. Who is your best friend? And I didn't know what to do about it. 
Detective McCamus has extracted a murder confession from 65-year-old Jay Roth. But Roth is yet to disclose what he did with Linda Riley's body. Can McCamus get the answers that Linda's family so desperately needs? Everybody knows this poor woman is dead, okay? But for our purposes, we want the kind of closure that's gonna lock him in the penitentiary for the next thousand years, okay? And that, in this particular case, she's missing. There's still no body. Jay, what happened to the body? Well, where'd you take her, Jay? The last place we went, Aldridge. Aldridge? Okay. Yeah. Burned her. You buried her. Burned her. You burned her. 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 When Roth actually admits killing Linda and burning her body, I think at first the detective is quite incredulous because he, he said, you buried her. And then when Roth says, no, I burned her, I think there is a little slight bit of shock there because that's not normal. I was not expecting anything like that, and so it was shocking to me at that point, and I was surprised when, when he clarified and said, no, no, I burned her. Who was your best friend? Where was it exactly, Jay, that you burned her? That road where I said we went down, down there that he didn't want to go because it was so muddy there. Mm -hmm. Down there. Right down there? Yeah. Is she still out there? What's left? What's left? Yeah. Are her bones still out there? I don't know. I don't know if there's anything left. Did you take any of her bones with you? No. No? The way in which people that commit murder dispose of, of remains is significant. Someone that's just been discarded and set on fire, that just basically goes a long way to, to tell us that really Rolf didn't have that much respect for her. You know, it's, it's almost a, a complete desecration of the person. Who is your best friend? All through the interviews, all of the interviews, Roth talks about his love, his admiration, how he was looking after Linda. But there was a part of it that was almost like control and coercive behaviour. And when he's killed her, the worst thing he could have done was to desecrate her body. And he did that. He burned her so that there's no sign of her left. You don't do that to people that you love and care about. That is inexcusable absolutely inexcusable. The confession was so critical in this case. Without the confession, we would have never come to any type of closure with the case as to what happened um, and the manner of which she was disposed. It just, it, it would have been impossible to have ever had any resolution for that. Did you go fishing at all that day when you brought her out there? Yes. You did fish? Did you fish while you were burning her or? How did that happen? Yeah, I had a line in the water. Okay. How long did you let that fire go? I don't know, but probably three or four hours, something like that. What would you think about taking us out there and, and showing us exactly where it is? That way maybe we can, would you? Yeah. I figured you would. Yeah. I think you're right. I can't believe it hurt her. I can't work so much. It hurt her How about I get you some water? I'll get you a cup of water real quick. I'll take a quick run. I'll get you some water. Police interviews can last a few hours, can last days. So when somebody finally confesses, suddenly it's like a massive burden has been lifted. You know, it's almost like carrying a heavy weight. And when that, that weight's taken off that person, you know, that's the, the effect 
that happens on his on his psychology the fact he just literally is exhausted you know that's what finally caused Roth to stop crying and just basically collapse onto the desk stand up Jay stand up for us Jay after Jay confessed and when he started to give the appearance of becoming emotional I'd like to think that maybe there was some sense of remorse there realizing what had happened I think it was more knowing that uh, he's going to go to jail for the rest of his life for, for what he has done. On March 4th of 2012, six days after Linda Riley went missing, Jay Roth accompanied police to the location where he burned her body. Roth was charged with felonious restraint, kidnapping, and second-degree murder. The reason why it's a murder second charge is because there is the absence of a premeditated murder and therefore does not fit the elements of the crime for a murder in the first. Despite having confessed to the crime, as time went on, it became unclear how Jay would plead. It was drawn out right to the last minute. I, I thought we were going to go to trial. I thought uh, that he was going to fight it. Then right at the last minute, Jay decided to take the, the plea deal and, and pled to second degree murder. Jay is an older guy, right? And he's hoping to get out of prison someday. So with second degree, he is eligible for probation. There is light at the end of the tunnel. His best bet is to plea bargain it. The state saves a whole bunch of money. The family's happy because they don't have to sit in court and look at this, this mope every day for several weeks. And, and so it's a, de a deal's cut that perhaps you will get out on probation one day. Ch chances are slim that he does not. During sentencing, Roth's attorney argued that a maximum penalty of only 10 years should apply because of his client's age and ill health. But the circuit court judge firmly disagreed, saying Roth was a danger to women and children. In July 2013, Roth was sentenced to life imprisonment in Missouri, which means 30 years. He must serve 40% of that sentence, which means he's going to be 78 before he's eligible for parole. To the relief of Linda's family and friends, it seems unlikely that Roth will live long enough to ever taste freedom again.